so much. Thank you. What I'd like to do is, is talk about materials, uh, biomedical materials in particular. And I'm an engineer, a chemical engineer, as was mentioned. But one of the th what I did when I graduated from college is I actually uh, went to work in a, a, in a hospital. And, I w and one of the things I started doing was working in medical materials. And I was very surprised, actually, when I started looking into this. How did materials get into medicine? I would have thought maybe by chemists or material scientists. But when I looked at this, I saw pretty much through the entire 20th century, they were always driven by medical doctors. And what the doctors did is because they urgently wanted to solve a problem, they'd go to their house and they'd find some object that in their house that would resemble the tissue or organ they'd want to fix, and they'd use it in a person. So for example, uh, just to give you a few examples, take the artificial heart. So here, what happened was, is that uh, the scientists at the NIH, clinicians at the NIH wanted to make an artificial heart, and they said, well, what object kind of has a good flex life like a heart? And they said, a lady's girdle. That, by the way, was 1967. But that's what they did. They made the artificial heart out of the lady's girdle. And now, uh, 45 years later, that's still what they make the artificial heart out of because once you start down that path from a regulatory, like FDA standpoint, it's very hard to change. But the artificial heart hasn't worked very well, right? Blood hits the surface of the artificial heart and uh, it can form a clot. Uh, that clot can go to the patient's brain and cause a stroke and they die. But if you think about it, something was designed to be a lady's girdle, that's probably not the optimal blood contacting material. And this problem pervades all of medicine. I have a few other examples here just to highlight one other one, breast implants. One of those was actually a mattress stuffing. You, you can probably think of the logic. <laughs> and so, 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 so one of the things that I started thinking about as an engineer when I saw this is I thought maybe we can do better. Rather than take these materials from our house, maybe we can ask questions. What do we really want in these materials from an engineering standpoint, biology standpoint, and chemistry standpoint? And then could we synthesize them, make them by chemistry? Now, I'm going to give you some examples, some that have already been done, some that might be three to five years out, and some that will take uh, e e you know, even longer. But I wanted to give you a feel. First, I'm going to give you an example of something we've already done. But I also want to highlight in this something that I think is really important for everybody here that talks about innovation, which is not only what you do, but also sometimes the opposition you get when you do it. So when we started this work, and this was actually in the early 80s, the only material, polymer, that was FDA approved was polymers that degraded uh, and showed what we call bulk erosion. And that means they dissolve like this. So if you put a drug in it, you could imagine if it dissolves like this, that if it was a toxic drug like insulin or an anti-cancer drug, when this happens, it could just dump out, and that could actually kill someone. So we said that's probably not so good. So we said, from an engineering standpoint, how should we want that polymer to dissolve? And we said, well, what we really want is a polymer to dissolve like this, what we call surface erosion. And we went through a very detailed chemical engineering design analysis to make a family of polymers, which we called polyanhydrides, that did exactly this. And by changing the chemistry, we could make them last for almost any length of time. And then one of my friends, uh, Henry Bram, who was a neurosurgeon, was uh, just starting at Johns Hopkins, said, well, could we come up with a way maybe to use this for treating brain cancer patients? This was in 1985. And in particular, he would be treating these patients, uh, and, and of course, it's a terrible disease. People are almost always dead within a year. And the, what he wanted was asking me is, could we do something like this? Could he operate on the patient? He's gonna, they're going to operate anyhow. But before they close the patient's brain up, could they take a chemotherapy drug, which you normally give systemically throughout the body? Could you give it locally, right to the target? And the way they do that is, could they put little wafers in the brain right before they close it up? Now, this drug normally lasts 12 minutes. But we could make these polymers last for months or years. So that's what we did. We locally delivered the drug from a polymer wafer that, in this case, lasted for a month. And the power of this is that you get local chemotherapy, high concentrations in the brain where you want it to be, and low concentrations in the rest of the body where it causes harm. Now, the, the point that I mentioned, and I want to highlight this, is that when we first, you know, in 1980, put forth these ideas about new materials and that they could be used in medicine, what happens in, if you're a professor and you want to do these projects, you have to raise money. And the way we raise money is we write grants, and then mostly, in my case, those grants would go to the National Institutes of Health, and they would be reviewed by what's called a study section, which are professors at other universities that tell you what they think about it and decide whether you should get the money or not. And, and we did terrible. We got all types of opposition. I'll just highlight some of these. In 1981, when we first proposed it, the chemist said, you'll never be able to synthesize the polymers. 
but I had a very good graduate student named Howie Rosen. He later became president of the Alza Corporation, $12 billion company, uh, and he synthesized them. And then we sent the grants back, and the scientists said, well, but you know, these polymers are very reactive. Whatever drug you put in, they'll react with. It won't work. I had another couple of postdocs, uh, Bob Linhart. He's now a very famous professor at RPI, and Cam Leung, also a very famous professor at Duke. And they uh, worked out ways so that that didn't happen. And then people said, still won't work. These polymers are fragile. They'll break in the body. I had another couple of postdocs, Edith Mathiewicz, who now is a, a very well-known professor at Brown University, and uh, Avi Dome, who became head of a major department at Hebrew University in Israel. And they showed that, uh, they showed that wouldn't happen. Then people said uh, that the materials would be toxic. But here I had help from Mike Marletta, who's now president of Scripps in California, and, uh, and Kata Lorenzen, who did a lot of the toxicology studies, later became a, a, a president uh, uh, of uh, University of Connecticut School of Medicine. So anyhow, this kept going on and on until 1996 when the FDA approved it. it was the, uh, and it was the first time in actually over 20 years they ever approved uh, a, a, you know, a new treatment for brain cancer and the first time they ever approved this idea of local chemotherapy. So you get this kind of opposition. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to say, as you can probably tell from the way I'm speaking, I'm really proud of how well all our graduate students and postdocs have done. They've become head of major departments, major corporations throughout the world. Whereas the reviewers at the other universities, uh, they haven't done so well. <laughs> now, 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 I'd like to show you what this operation looks like, but if anybody's squeamish and doesn't like the sight of blood, don't, don't look. But here, here is a little wafer going into the brain. You know, by the way, it's very hard to get good advice when you give a talk, but about 14 years ago, I was giving a lecture on this at MIT to a group of engineers, and my wife came to the lecture, and I said at the end of it, what did you think, Laura? And she said, well, she said, Bob, the talk was all right. That, by the way, is extremely high praise. <laughs> but she said, you know, you had that bloody slide on for over 10 minutes, uh, you know, and all those poor engineers were turning green. So now I give a warning and show it quickly. Anyhow, this was... Um, Th th this was a, a little bit of some of the clinical data showing that, it, and again, this is, this is probably going to be limited to patients that have localized uh, tumors, but you can see even after two years, you get a five-fold increase in survival. Also, the principle of local chemotherapy for polymers that we advance not only got to be used here and in other types of cancer, but really where it's made an even greater impact is using the very same idea later on in drug-eluting stents. This, in fact, was done by another of my students, Elazar Edelman, uh, who's now a professor at Harvard and MIT, as well as different companies. And now you can uh, take these stents, like if somebody has heart disease, they're used in over a million patients a year. Uh, you put them in, uh, but sometimes you get the, the vessels get clogged because of an injury. And now they can release, again, anti-cancer drugs like Taxol, and that prevents it from happening. Also, I started thinking of other ways materials might be helpful. And, and, and just to give you another idea, uh, and, and it really goes along with what uh, Brian Roberts was saying earlier, you know, one of the things that's happened in medicine so that you don't have to stay in hospitals as long is a whole idea of minimally invasive surgery. 30 years ago, if you had a gallbladder operation, they'd make a big incision in you, and they'd take the gallbladder out. But because they made that big incision, you'd be in the hospital for days, and you wouldn't be back to work for months. Now, they do something called minimally invasive therapy. They make a tiny incision. They put these scopes down the hole, and you can take the gallbladder out just through those, that little hole. You're out of the hospital in less than a day, back to work in a few days. So I started thinking, you know, if you could do that, if you could take objects out through those holes, maybe we could put all kinds of medical devices in through those holes, even bulky medical objects. Now, that might sound like science fiction, but the idea I had is maybe we could make materials that under one set of conditions could have one shape, like a string, to go into that hole, but under another set of conditions, say when it's warmer, like body temperature, it could change into whatever shape we want. So Andreas Lendlein, one of my postdocs, synthesized a number of these. We actually worked out ways to change it by temperature, going from room temperature to body temperature, or even heat, uh, I'm sorry, even light, like a fiber optic, one wavelength to another. So I'm just going to show you a couple of videos. First video, I'm going to show you a string at room temperature, then it's going to go to body temperature water, and I hope it changes into a coil like this. So here's the video. Here's the string at room temperature air, goes into body temperature water, and it does that. Let me give you a second example. Let's say you had a surgical wound outside the body, like uh, in, in your face or your hand, arm. Well, if you, if you had a wound like that, you'd want to tie a suture. It's actually not that hard to do. I, I could even do it, though you probably wouldn't want me to. But um, 
What about inside the body? What if you had a, a wound in the stomach or the lung? How could you tie the knots then? So we thought, what if we could make the knots tie themselves? What if we could loop in a loose knot like a lasso at room temperature uh, and then have it just tighten at body temperature? So let me just show you another video. Here's the loose knot at room temperature air. And now it goes to body temperature water and it tightens. Let me give you a third example. And this is, again, uh, it might seem more space age, but we hear, you know, you always hear about computers and chips. And of course, they're, they're, they're used in all kinds of uh, things and in, in, in computers and television. So one day I was watching a TV show on that and I thought, well, maybe we could use it in a drug delivery system. And so with Michael Sima, one of my colleagues, and John Santini, our student, we made a very different kind of chip. This is a more of a chemistry chip where you could put little wells in, cover them, in this case, with gold, and you could actually put uh, multiple drugs, uh, different doses of the same drug in, uh, or many drugs in. Literally, you could think theoretically years from now of a pharmacy on a chip. And we used kinds of new uh, photolithography and other techniques to make these chips. This is an early one, 34 wells in the top, 34 in the bottom in the United States dime, just for comparison. And by the way, they can be made any size or shape, and they can even be made injectable. Let me show you how they work. Here's a well, it's covered with gold, but we're going to apply, and you can do this by remote control, by telemetry, the same way you open a garage door. We can apply a small amount of voltage, and in less than 10 seconds, the gold comes off. When it does, the drug can come out. So no drug could come out for two years. Then you trigger it, and it all could come out. And just as a proof of principle, here we've delivered different amounts of drug at different times, and here um, we've delivered multiple drugs at different times. One of the things that's very exciting is in about two weeks, we're coming out with a paper in a journal called Science Translational Medicine, which is the first human trial of this. And what we did here is we took parathyroid hormone, um, and, uh, uh, and basically that's a drug you want to give in a pulsatile fashion. If it's given continuously, it causes bone resorption, but it's very important to give it for women with osteoporosis. And a tiny incision was made in a doctor's office. The women didn't hardly even know that it's there. And then what's amazing is now what's been done in this clinical trial is you simply over special med medical frequency uh, wavelength, you just give a signal, out comes a drug whenever uh, it, you, you want it to. So you, and it actually shows less variation to the patient than injections. So, and this was done over a six month period. Last example that I wanted to give you is could you actually someday um, not all, combine cells uh, to make new tissues, not necessarily organs. The organs, as, as Brian talked about, you know, that's many years away. Tissues may not be quite so far away, and I'll give you an example or two of that. So the idea that Jay Vacanti and I had was could we take cells, um, and those could be stem cells, but we made the slide up before people used stem cells. Uh, this was in science a, a number of years ago. But you could take virtually any cell type, put it on a, the right kind of scaffold, grow it outside the body, and then you could make virtually uh, any, uh, any tissue you want. That was sort of the idea. Now, some tissues are much easier than others, and the tissue that's been most advanced and based on some licenses from us and other things is human skin. And let me just give you an example of that, which is now actually on the market. Um, and, and, and here you see a little boy who's very badly burned. Um, and what you can do, though, is take the product, which in this case is neonatal skin fibroblasts, and you can... Uh, on the polymer scaffold, you can put it in the child at the time of injury. It looks like this. But if you come back three weeks later, looks like this. If you come back six months later, he's pretty much healed. These are now approved both for patients with burns and patients with diabetic skin ulcers. Um, and, 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 and so that's one example. Another example, and this sort of relates to the ear, uh, can you make cartilage? Could you make cartilage? Now, uh, we're actually doing a couple things. The ear thing, interestingly enough, even though that got a lot of publicity a number of years ago, we're actually working, Jay Vacanti, who's the, my collaborator and I, with the United States Army, because patients come back from Iraq and Afghanistan, unfortunately, without body parts, like ears and other things. And so we hope, actually, in the next couple of years, uh, we'll, we'll actually be able to help people like that. But even short of that, there are patients with congenital defects. So here's a little boy who doesn't have a chest covering his heart. He was 12 years old at the time, but like other 12-year-olds, he likes to play baseball. But you could imagine if he ever got hit in the chest with a baseball, he could die. So actually, uh, Jay operated on him. We made a polymer scaffold, 
gave him his own cells and actually recreated a new chest. The last example I wanted to give you, still obviously in the laboratories, could you even help people with spinal cord repair? So I'm just going to show you rats. But, but here what we did is we made a special scaffold with, in this case, neuronal stem cells. We did this with Evan Snyder and Ted Tang and Aaron Levick, who is one of my graduate students, now professor at Case Western, led the study. So we actually did about 50 of these animals. And uh, what I'll show you in the first one, which is the mean of the control group, is uh, what normally happens. So what you see when you look at this, at these animals is two things, at least. The, he's trouble supporting his weight, and the paws are splayed in a rather awkward fashion. And there's actually a scoring system you can use for these animals. So he hits about a five. 20 is what is, would be optimal. It's a BBB scoring system. Now then what we did, this is actually 100 days after the injury. And then what we did is we actually did the same kind of thing, but we took these specially designed scaffolds uh, along with neuronal stem cells. And we put these in, and we also followed the animals. And all of these were followed for 400 days. Since that's 100 days, let me just show you an experiment. Again, the mean of the experimental group, also at 100 days. And here you see this can, this is hardly a cure, still a lot to do, uh, he, he, but he can bear his own weight. And also the paws, as you see, are splayed in a much more normal fashion. Again, out of a maximum of 20, he would get a 14, and 20 is what a regular rat would get, five was what the rats in the mean of the last group got. Notice the paws splayed much more normally. M my wife told me not to leave that on too long either. <laughs> What's happened now is there's even a company in Vivo Therapeutics, they licensed this, and now they've done this in primates, they've gotten pretty similar results, and the hope is again to try it some manner or another to move this to the clinic uh, in, in the next a couple of years. But in a broad way, what I've wanted to try to get across uh, this evening is really, I think, that material science and medicine, and actually material science broadly, we've heard all kinds of great talks about biomimicry, about new materials in, uh, in construction, and all kinds of things. I think material science is an incredibly exciting area that, for which there's an enormous amount of innovation that I think can really transform our society in a, in a very positive way. Thank you very much.